I'll share this one. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for screen. agreeing to give a Build a Soul seminar, and you can get started. Yes, thanks very much for for having me, having you. Uh, uh, thanks for the great uh, work uh, you're doing, Kate, for bringing the people together. It's actually straightforward to do, right? But you do it very well, so it's really great. Uh, so apparently, uh, we need to introduce ourselves, which is actually good. Uh, so I'm biophysics. I'm here in Munich uh, trying to push a bit origins of life. Um, background is biotechnology. And, um, you know, we have one startup, which none of tempers. So we could actually, in physics, push the origin of life early on without being, um, you know, looked down on and... and, and uh, we had enough freedom to, to push it. So um, that was actually very, very nice. So basically what I want to tell you today is, is linkages between origin of life research and, you know, build a cell. I would tell you a little bit why I say cell-free cells as we go along. Um, the idea being that uh, we, we'd like to make bridges from what we think in origin of life, where we think that uh, you know, pores in rocks could be interesting setting to think about the first molecules and actually then show you some experiments where, you know, making vesicle cells, but also making without vesicles in these pores, uh, cell-free systems and systems which, you know, run the, the basic modern machinery still seems to work out. So the, the, the thing is really the hope that we can make a bridge between origin of life and then all the way back to evolved life already that that still would work but just for yourself and i'm really happy for discussing this um and the whole thing of course origin of life starts with this enormously violent earth scenario and these delicate molecules making darwinian evolution and trying to understand how that matches together and one of the ideas to to think about volcanic heated water these are from iceland uh, or hot vapor coming by these volcanic rocks which are all porous thinking that that would be a very strong heating and still cooling on the other side and thinking how temperature differences can 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 be an interesting driving source and that has been the focus of what we're doing basically thinking about what what temperature differences can do kind of very very basic way of, of putting things out of equilibrium and how that could match up with with the biochemistry and chemistry of, of living systems. So basically what, what we started off um, was temperature, what water and temperature difference without air bubbles. We, we took great care not to have air bubbles and everybody doing some micro macro fluidics knows how difficult that is. And then later on, you know, with this publication mostly starting thinking about what air bubbles are doing in a system where you have uh, air water interface you know some millimeters wide uh, and um, and having a air water interface in there and and you know these are basically one of the first runs we, we looked at you have this water it makes a meniscus to the gas and you look with fluorescence from the side and you actually if you have some dna in here you see after some seconds that you get the a bright line building up here and then you you know dig into the physics what's going on here and if you have a warm and a cold side you you have at the same time always going on evaporation and recondensation of water so it basically makes a tiny 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 water cycle what you have in the atmosphere in the large scale this is running on millimeter scale and uh, does interesting things and um, you can do modeling of this you can have we look with beads, how the speed of these movements and actually can determine how this flow of water evaporating actually leaves behind a trace of that accumulated DNA. So as you uh, evaporate here water, the DNA can't help being moved to that corner where the water evaporates. And that's a flow speed about 10 micrometer per second and only by diffusion can keep against it. And that fine, white line you're seeing here can be actually explained by that model and you can look how the accumulation looks that's DNA concentration logarithmic scale here 
for you know 100 more of DNA, RNA behaves the same. And you see how that fully physical model of that evaporation cycle is matching the dynamics and the amplitude quite well. And that's quite useful um, to, to have these modeling in the backhand that you know we can be, analyze these systems a bit similar to an engineer would do to think about do we fully understand can we predict before doing the experiment and, and do a design of our most favorite pore uh, which would be best in running the system so i'll shortly go through these cases which are in the nature chemistry paper but then mostly we'll also show you unpublished result uh, to, to give you a little idea here how to bridge to the um, synthetic cell bottom-up cell production with such a system but also show you a little bit what our recent ideas and on the origins of life how, how this could perhaps work out so what the interface uh, and uh, could do uh, and you know just a air bubble in this warm cold interface is enough uh, is that you have also here inflow of the liquid as it evaporates and if you have you know higher concentrations, molecules crystallize. This is interesting because it's a precursor molecule of RNA. So, and it crystallize in a chirally pure form, but uh, you can also have uh, wet dry cycles. And we'll see those a bit more in detail in the movie also, which drive, for example, the phosphorylation of, um, um, of RNA, uh, which might, you know, is an important step in, in RNA world scenario. But then if you have ribozymes, these are these you know, delicate uh, sequences which can be catalytically active. Uh, here they cut the substrate and this substrate has a fluorescent dye and a quencher pair so that you see the brightness, the brightness of the substrate, how this ribozyme molecule works. And that is uh, something we see over and over that these ribozymes love these interfaces, are accumulated to the interfaces and they, co-accumulate all the strands, co-accumulate also magnesium and ions, and they really work very well. And you see here how the surface is productive and it actually, with a convection flow in these temperature differences, goes across the whole chamber. Um, uh, if you have RNA or DNA, which likes to form gels or aggregates by having a lot of complementary sequence, they accumulate and the accumulation is, is kind of, uh, self-enhancing because once two are binding the diffusion coefficient gets lower and therefore has a harder time to escape this accumulation field and gets more and more accumulated to the point that you create these millimeter sized dragons of of uh, uh, solid material almost solid material made out of rna uh, or in this case i think dna alone so that would be interesting because nice to store sequence coherent material but of course, and here's the first jump towards uh, lipid uh, vesicles, if you have a lipid and a DNA, two color channels running at the same time, such a setting, here you have air, here you have your buffer, and you let it run for a while and it accumulates the lipid to the point that it actually can form vesicular structures. And the right hand side co-accumulates the DNA, so you have DNA accumulated here and at the same time you accumulate lipids that you form in your solution highly concentrated co-forming materials I, I don't even dare to tell you how that's multi you know has a, probably a lot of uh, um, cell uh, vesicle walls multi-laminar uh, it's a little bit uh, more chaotic but you see already here in the flow that that this temperature difference with a, a water interface can give you also dynamics of ripping them apart doing kind of cell division and uh, as you'll see later as we go along the talk the idea would be that while the most evolution in these pores would happen in the bulk phase in these accumulated uh, phases at the interface mostly uh, this process here is for me quite interesting because you inherently would have a mechanism by which you can wrap up these materials in a very, you know, form which is protected from the outside to, you know, take it as a spaceship to other, to other places and put it on other probes. And I think, you know, from my 
perspective here, that would have been the, the early cause of why wrapping it up things in the vesicles, because uh, that would protect it. It would have a hard time to get nutrients inside and so on and so forth, which, you know, the open bulk is much more easy to do. But uh, that co-accumulation here would be actually interesting setting to send material out into other places. Kind of a spermia, panspermia between these, uh, uh, a vehicle for that uh, between the pores. So th that on the left hand side, um, what you've seen are DOPC vesicles, a little bit more highly involved uh, uh, species. But the Ram Krishnamurthy showed that you know chemistry, uh, which is used for phosphorylation of RNA actually can give you a similar structure. So those are nice because they're very tight and well behaved, but also oleic acid vesicles can be in the same setting made uh, to form a vesicular structure. And we took a little bit of time to figure out these wrapping up the material, what, what characteristics the DNA inside you have. In this case, we look at um, protection against DNAs. So, um, we could uh, demonstrate here that uh, you can, while DNA is without the lipids, uh, gets chewed up as normal. You'll get the DNAs if you have it wrapped up here into these vesicular structures is protected. And with the FRET signal, which you're recording here with a you know FRET pair, you can also confirm that within these vesicular structures, you are getting um, almost normal. Uh, not fully, uh, um, uh, almost normal melting curve of your of your uh, DNA inside. Uh, so you just monitor how the strands are separating as you go through it, and uh, uh, you can compare how the vesicles here behave, the heating and cooling, and they plateau out a little bit at the different fret levels. So there seems to be still uh, interaction with the lipids or with the structure. But overall, you get a similar melting curve. And a third test of how happy uh, these uh, uh, DNA is, is you can use an aptomer structure, which lights up um, uh, chromophores, and uh, actually find that uh, with the aptomer, you can actually uh, see that lighting up the action of the aptomer wrapping around the chromophore. Uh, very much the same in these vesicular structures. So in that sense, you know, these settings could give you, you know, like uh, other ways of having microfluidics to produce these more defined vesicle structures, you know, these more messy things at the water interface with the temperature gradient is actually sufficient to wrap things into vesicular structures. And um, uh, that, you know, that's the first bridge towards thinking about how early things could could be made in a vesicular way uh, in the future. Um, so that's all happening because of this accumulation here. Uh, but when we think about origin of life, we think about replication, we think about RNA world scenarios, how to build the steps towards that RNA world. And uh, that accumulation here, you know, could help us. And that's what I want to focus in the next uh, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes on uh, chemistry, which, which we think is could be interesting for, for a model of the origin of life, uh, and that is helped by this non-equilibrium. So it might be not the best high yield chemistry, it might not be the fastest, but by helping it with these accumulation, for example, here you could get increased yield in your origin of life. And by that, we, we try to aim for a chemistry which you know, is not is a little bit more mild, slow, but has a lot of recycling capabilities. So if something goes wrong, it can cut it open again, go back and recycle the RNA. And the best is we try to go for a balance between these two. Um, while we started early with, you know, very fast, harsh EDC condensing agents, you know, which can do some things interesting, you know, templated uh, ligation can be run in it if you are careful enough. Um, and we looked into imidazole uh, activation, which Czech Shostak uh, has pioneered very well for replication base by base level, have looked actually into three five prime cyclic GMP, which can polymerize in the dry state uh, for G only as far as we can say. Um, 
and uh, has however bit the problem to make these awkward uh, cyclic highly strained cyclic phosphate that's a difficult task for prebiotic chemistry and now actually look into two three prime cyclic gmp but also the other bases to think what we can do in here and the, the advantage of that setting is that that's kind of the easiest uh act, you know phosphorylation form which has a little bit elevated uh um, energy. And what we are pleased by in, in looking into what these molecules can do is that they uh, run many reactions of very low magnesium concentrations, which uh, in our enabled and ribozyme world often is not the case. Um, it, it also needs only, you know, basically no salt, so that balance of it is, is is uh, quite rather sweet waterish at this point, which many ribozymes need high magnesium and always then have the trouble if they replicate something, the double-stranded form of RNA is super tightly bound. Uh, and if you want to release that by temperature, that's also not a solution because the high magnesium uh, has a high hydrolysis rate and you just cut the RNA into pieces very easily. Um, so, that's especially the case if you go for really enhanced pH. So we go a little bit high in pH, but we can, you know, save the RNA structure still because uh, we have low magnesium. So that's a bit turned out, uh, you know, we didn't do that because we thought that's the way it must be, but because the, you know, the chemistry of the processes were showing that as the optimal case and the best case. So what's kind of the origin of life scenario? Let's go a little bit faster here so the idea is that the phosphorylation in dry state could give you that that a dry state like in this three five prime could also polymerize that and then if they switch then to the wet phase so if things go down at the bottom side of these air water interface chambers uh the two three prime hopefully would go for a ligation step which could give us with the uh, cycling in these chambers uh replication dynamics as the strands melt easily at this magnesium level and then hopefully you know give us a way to even go for ribozyme so that's a bit the hope to make this whole linkage going and what you always have these a little bit elevated ph and and you know in water is that it hydrolyzes and it hydrolyzes with quite some uh, ratio back directly into two three activation but the hope is that that recycling of breaking up the RNA into pieces back into its uh, constituents could be an uh, interesting point. So first step is polymerization. Can we in the dry make these polymerize? We have to go for analysis first, have a HPLC mass spec pipeline, which separates it by length, calibrates um, the counts of the, uh, of the mass spectrometer, you know, which has some length characteristics and also have some precipitation protocol, which still, you know, can preserve our dimers without too much artifact. And we, you know, calibrate that. And the second time we have to, you know, look out for the masses. So this is kind of what the mass spec gives us. And I've written here a lab view program to analyze these, that we understand these co-flying ions, identify our peaks, even if we have quite complex polymerization products which means on the one hand side if if you know they're far apart the different molecules then we have an easy way to identify but we can also fit the whole you know isotope pattern of each of the species for all the charge states the the AZ gives us or actually have if they're getting close together have a full fit of of the uh, isotope pattern onto the raw data of the mass spectrometer and, and by that we can analyze even mixtures of five six mirrors uh, with the four bases and really analyze what we get out um, so uh, that's where we are and uh, what it happens in the dry state that the two three prime um, um, phosphate nucleotides at least for g here but you can see polymerize reasonably well at these elevated ph we see all what we are expecting in phos uh, phosphorus nmr uh, the polymerization loves rather moderate temperatures, 40 degrees below at 30. It, you know, there's a big gap here. Uh, it's 80 drops quite a bit, 60 is between. It loves potassium. You know, that might 
uh, hint towards quadruplexes as one part of the story. Um, uh, sodium is a little bit less and magnesium it doesn't like at all. You know, that's basically 40 millimeter of magnesium polymerization is, is not liking that. The polygy is the, the boss in the polymerization. The others fall behind quite strongly. U keeps up a bit. C and A alone doesn't work, but the funny thing, and that's something we keep optimizing, is that if we have mixtures of GC, then C is co-polymerized with it. So the G can help the C. And now if you do that into one of these chambers, which, you know, that's an image of how the bubble dynamics really looks like. You have dew droplets, which just recondensed. Otherwise there's, you know, air here, but you see a lot of dry down material. It's the interface it's about if you run that reaction with all the four bases each at five millimolar reasonable moderate concentrations uh, you actually see that you get in the chamber better polymerizations of the g but also more polymerization of these mixed uh, nucleotide sequences so still you know you don't get like from the oligosynthesizer each of the sequences same concentration random sequences that's not what you get but you can get to a little bit longer sequences the problem is still that these are still a little bit too short that they would you know bind to each other and really be prepared for the next step but uh it is not so bad what these are doing so the the, the point here is to make that uh we just need that droplet of air and that larger droplet of air can be now on top of things you know or it could actually be at the bottom and that's something Christina Dischel in our group has explored because we have and I'll show you shortly how that works um, we have typically focused on machineries by which we are accumulating molecules downward by a combination of thermal convection and an effect called thermophoresis, how molecules go from the warm to the cold side. And that gives you like a strong sedimentation of the molecules. And if you make the air droplet at the bottom, you have the big advantage that you then first get from very low concentrations top here, very strong high concentrations for the polymerization, which then runs here the wet dry cycles at the bottom. And, uh, you know, that solves a number of issues, uh, most of all that you can feed the material in. And, and these are experimental implementations. On the one hand side, the, you know, the convection is very laminar. It, it runs in a, in a thin sheet of that pore here, um, uh, about 170 micrometer across, and it accumulates. As you can see here, that's GFP in this case, but you can also see accumulation of DNA, RNA in a very similar way. So this is how it's done. Of course, you know, being coming from physics, you do this very well defined because you want to simulate, you want to, you know, reduce all the artifacts of, of uh, hydrophobic effects and things like that. So you make a, a Teflon foil, which a plotter is cutting out into these settings here and then do the experiments in one of these. Um, um, what, what this can do for you is that you really accumulate the, the monomers, uh, these single nucleotides here, to quite high concentrations. You can see over many orders of magnitude, that's the result after one day. You basically make the experiment, freeze it down, open the chamber and cut it into pieces and bring that into the uh, 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 mass spec, top to bottom. And these lines are now simulation lines. And those simulation lines give you uh, an idea how this system could behave. So what if, you know, if you would now feed here on top an empty chamber, you know, something we are not doing in experiment, we in experiment, we start already with a pre-filled chamber, but if it would be empty, it would, you know, get from micromolar concentrations, which you feed up here to 10 micromolar in a day, uh, basically in a week to 20 micromolar, and you approach the millimolar in a month or a little bit later. And what's interesting in these simulations, you know, on the one hand side, you can guess them at, you know, how long you need to run the experiment to, to do micromolar feeding, very low concentration feeding. You actually can also explore what happens if the whole structure on top is not fed anymore, if you just say, okay, let's assume there's a drought out there, there's no molecules coming in from the neighboring uh, chemistry, then all the molecules are keeping inside. So this is a really strong 
accumulation mechanism, which just grabs molecules and holds on to them. Uh, although, you know, the trap is only some one, two centimeters height. And that's basically the thing we like on this setting that it accumulates molecules and keeps it there uh, for reaction. And for the polymerization, as I told you that polymerization runs here in the dry state, this seems to be quite good. It, it's, it, it is boosting the polymerization. It is boosting the different sequences we can get from that. And it pushes the system to the point that we might start to see actually hybridization. But on the other hand side, and that's our second bridge to, to you know, creating cells and, and thinking about this system, if we would have evolved in the RNA world and ribosomes and everything together, right? Could we, you know, make here a cell where we get rid of the cell? So only have the inside of it and that whatever the transport systems, which are super important to keep all the molecules together and it's, you know, a major challenge if you want to build cells, right? How you, how you keep it out of equilibrium that the molecules kept inside, that we could just take those molecules out, make a cell-free system and let it accumulate by that strange thermophrase convection force. So we remove all the membrane transport. You know, the confinement of the vesicles will be taken over by that micro, micro hundreds of micrometer scale. Um, the concentration gradient, which without lipids you wouldn't have, it would just dilute out and, and you would need to you know, keep up the concentration by some mean of pipetting or whatever. This would be taken over by the temperature gradient and uh, keep it feeding. So also here, one could think about feeding it, of course, with some ATP and other. Um, so the, the, the question is, if we go from here to these dead components in equilibrium, if you know, it diffuse out, they're just dead, can we re-concentrate them and restart the process of, uh, of transcription translation? And I wouldn't, uh, you know, introduce it this way if it wouldn't work. You know, the very short story here, and that's uh, in preparation, um, is that this convection flow you see on the left-hand side, if we put that in a chamber with 26 to 40 degrees, and we go for a pure accession, uh, expression system, um, the standard E. coli cell-free didn't work out so well in, in our setting, but the pure system, you can now do the control as follows. If we have it in this chamber and we have it horizontal, right? There's no you know, gravity acting on the liquid. You get no convection, but everything is the same. And you do a three-time diluted cell-free. So if you dilute a cell-free for, you know, the experts know this, but uh, you basically shut down the system. It, it only needs a specific concentration under which, you know, it's... It's crowded enough that it actually works. If you dilute it threefold, your activity is basically dead. The system doesn't do anymore. So you see, still see the proteins, right? You see here, but you see no expression of, of a superfolded GFP. You are expressing, trying to express it. So in horizontal mode, there's nothing. If you now put it up into vertical mode, what you see is that on top, you deplete the, the, the proteins. And it's already visible that for some reasons, which is still a little bit magic for us, but that's quite interesting, uh, they are accumulating very similar. All kinds of parts of that pure system accumulates at the bottom. And at the bottom, it accumulates enough to compensate that initial threefold dilution and lo and behold, express GFP. So we can kind of rescue uh, the diluted system back again, accumulating the system. So that shows a number of points. Uh, uh, number one is, is all the proteins accumulate in a similar way. You know, all the ion accumulation you also get in the system seems to be competitive enough that you can relaunch, relaunch it. You know, the phosphates, the magnesium, the, the salts are equally, you know, accumulated again that it's working well. And, um, you can really use this potentially that you can actually now also run a feeding flow on it. But let's see. I mean, this is already a, quite an interesting result that you can, you know, have a self, a truly self-free cell just by a temperature gradient and no lipids and anything else. And you can keep it in an accumulated state and uh, rescue it. 
of course, we always ask to, when showing these results, how general is it? Do we need these really tight temperature gradients, which we normally use in the lab to have very fast accumulation? You know, these experiments in cell-free, of course, we'd like to have the accumulation within hours, not within days or months. Uh, and, and that's easily done by computation, showing that if you have different thicknesses, uh, diffusion will just bridge that. You know, here it's the width is not correct, the convection is too fast, but then the convection just transports the material down there and does the accumulation. So you need a little bit higher for compensating. Actually, if you tilt it around, you can get away with quite flat temperature gradients and still get very similar accumulation and thermocycling dynamics. So uh, we think um, also in quite flat temperature gradients, you should run these systems, but they will take a lot longer. And therefore we are a little bit limited to our highly focused sapphire chambers. So a little bit back, um, but we can have a lot of discussion on the, what I just showed uh, in the uh, afterwards. Uh, a little bit back to origin of life is about you know how we can phosphorylate this. One candidate is trimetaphosphate, by which we mostly get the cyclic one, two, three cyclic. Uh, and the trimetaphosphate isn't too difficult to make, but there are some other candidates from Ram Krishna Murthy and others. Let's see what you know the screen will give us what is already interesting they had no five prime which is would be bad for the polarization and in the same dry experiment you are already creating dimers so it seems that you can bridge from this phosphorylation and the polarization in one in one go uh, can we have these two three prime polymers uh, bind to each other you know for that the polarization would need to be a little bit better in diversity. Let's see how we can go and improve that. Uh, but that, for example, these structures, these sequences here can make a templated form here, the cyclic phosphate. And there's a body of work which sometimes in the past was hard to interpret, but I think now it's getting more and more clear. You know, again, pH nine, room temperature, low magnesium gives us these ligated products up here. So they bind actually together within days. It's not the fastest thing you can think of, but it actually works reliably. It seems not to be much depending on these bases here. And also hairpins can actually be close enough together to make the ligation. So after polymerization, there is actually the next step with the same chemistry seems to work, which is great. And um, I'll rush a little bit over this because it's probably not in this audience uh, the focus, um, but um, as we are evaporating uh, on the warm side and the cold side, you get these dew droplets, which in fluorescent mode, which you, you've seen before, you're not seeing because it's pure water, right? There's no dye, no DNA inside. And that's on the other side, countered by dried up uh, DNA. If uh, you, you know that meniscus drops a bit, or if you have these droplets come on the other side, after a while you distribute your material on top of the air water interface. And that of course, you know, dries up with these coffee ring effects where you have strong accumulation at the interface. Not only what we discussed before at the interface at the bottom to the water air, but you also have these droplets individually making these and uh, accumulation that can be monitored by fluorescence. Uh, you see these droplets accumulating here DNA at the surrounding. Please note that a typical DNA label here, and that's end labeled covalently linked, uh, is giving you very low yield in the dry state. So, so these are almost looks as if this, there's no DNA. It's actually not the case. You have a lot of DNA and it shows if these dew droplets come on the other side and actually sprinkle the water from this side to this side. Then brightens up but you see you know easily these evaporation dynamics and the accumulation as you and that's the focus of of of, of what we are interested in in these replication dynamics what we've uh, polymerization dynamics you've seen before here we actually look for replication under the uh, and that's prebiotic story. CO2 is a likely atmospheric gas at very high concentrations to also compensate the faint sun. Uh, back then, uh, you know, um, heating by the atmosphere was very important to not fry, not, uh, you know, freeze out. And you see that that's actually enhancing the separation of the strands because the pH drops in the dew droplets and you're actually also uh, by, um, by the low salt 
and low pH is rather separating the strands. And then if we have such a setting, we typically put in a PCR reaction to figure out the protein driven fast replication. How does it behave? And you know, this is then how this movie goes. That's Cyber Green now labeling the double stranded, which is replicated. And um, we see here actually this strong replication signal building up at the interface uh, quite dramatically. And you see that only if you have CO2 in the chamber, because we have chosen here to have this temperature, sorry, that's distorted here, this temperature being actually way below the melting temperature for, of your product. So only with these tricks of no salt cycling, pH cycling, you can actually separate the strands and run this replication uh, even more. Uh, it seems to be running in a way that it wants to make longer and longer strands. And those longer strands seem to have a lot of AT bias. So they basically can get better melting, but they can be really large. So we start with a 50 mer of template and then it goes up to 103,300 bases, um, which is from our side interpreted in a way that this uh, coffee ring effect and this accumulation dynamics is actually pushing the replication reaction towards long strands, which normally if you do the thermal cycling in PCR, you're rather pushed for short strands, you know, primer dimers, short things, which can replicate much faster. So, so that's already interesting, you know, preview, if there's a replication dynamics, it should give you the long strands. And uh, I might do it here a bit with what to show. I mean, we calibrated that fret uh, characteristics in salt and CO2, and lo and behold, what we see from sequencing are these sequences here in white, and they're actually exactly at the predicted melting temperature of the system. So, so the CO2 dry, you know, what we see with the FRET signal, calibrate with the wet with the FRET signal, is actually predicting what sequences come in because everything is only replicated if you can separate the strands. So it gives an interesting setting, but it also shows that the evolution really wants to go for long strands. So that's interesting. So if you would have, you know, something like a ribozyme capable of running replications, it should actually be able to get longer. Also these ligation reactions, which are right now super slow, if, you know, they would run for a long time, they should actually go for long strands. And what we are together with Hannes Mutschler, now at Dortmund, and he gave a talk in this round before, trying to explore is to, to go back to a Sun Y system, which is capable of ligating, that that ligation can run the hammerhead ligation out of sh short pieces. Here are the three pieces. And normally, you know, this is on a template, and yes, it can replicate the template, and you see it once you rip it off by your denaturing gel at 50 millimolar magnesium. And at lower magnesium, it doesn't work at all, but in the fork chamber, it does because at the interface, you accumulate the magnesium. So that's interesting and actually shows that within the fork chamber, we are seeing the product of that hammerhead cleavage, although everything is in one chamber. So, um, you know, that's a prospect where we think might be quite a nice setting, nice sweet spot for RNA world. Of course, we try to do things like self-replication in there and have a look. With that said, uh, I want to highlight here uh, a paper by Christoph Must. You know, um, he actually looked into uh, the magnesium sodium ratio, right? Even if you go for small concentration for some of these ribozymes, the ratio is critical if you add too much of the monovalent salt, sodium in this case, uh, and then you have a low ratio of this uh, concentration, then the ribozyme just doesn't like it and it's inactive. And unfortunately, if you do a, ask a geoscientist, and that's within our collaboration here, for a basalt and you look out what you get if you leach that salt for a while, you actually get a mixture which is rather on this inactive site, or rather I have to say quite strongly on this inactive site. It, has, it doesn't have enough magnesium per sodium ion. And what Christoph figured out and find that quite funny is that if you make a flow through system and he's now the master of these flow through thermophoretic traps, you actually accumulate magnesium much more than sodium that's based on 
the thermophoretic characteristic, the so-called Soray coefficient is stronger for magnesium than sodium because there's two charges versus one. You know, one actually understands that. Uh, you get here the accumulation in this green regime. And actually, if it takes that buffer down there and runs it on a ligation ribozyme, you actually make the ribozyme work. Although if you initially would just give it the initial leach, it wouldn't work at all. So that's quite interesting. So these temperature gradients can also push the ratio of two ions, which otherwise would be quite hard to think about how you could do that, unless you really you know, evaporate, but then you have tons of other problems. Uh, but this very simple flow system, pore system, gives you that cleanup of the ion distribution, uh, which runs the ribozymes. And you just... Uh, got the cover on the nature chemistry where this chest came out. It's kind of this Godzilla RNA coming out of the rocks. Rocky stars for ribozymes. It's uh, quite nice uh, graphics. Okay, so uh, I'll come to the end. Uh, I just wanted to give you these whole story where we try to crack open, you know, one way from the RNA to the RNA world. Uh, those are PhD students, Avinash postdoc, uh, work very hard on this project. We had, uh, you know, some symmetry breaking ideas at Shetoyabe is back in Japan. And these are recent papers, you know, uh, you can actually have a look. I don't have time to, to get into those, but, you know, we could have a discussion. So that's basically a short strip of accumulation, which is size selective. So that's interesting length dependent replication can be induced by a similar setting. Uh, here, uh, Annalena Saldit uh, managed to get one of those ribozymes from Jerry Joyce, which runs a exponential replication, get that going in a thermal convection where you only heat one spot. And we figured out that templated ligation gets structured sequences from random short pieces. Um, it's quite interesting showing that that ligation I showed you, you know, in that chemistry could, you know, rather get non-random sequences out. And there is a project where we showed that tRNA could actually make a replicator. That's uh, out in the life out here. Okay, with that said, you know, that's again how the machines are running kind of robotically uh, scanning through chambers. We are lucky enough that uh, we managed to get some infrastructure, some networks going, origins class with astrophysics, particle physics in Munich. We are asking for elongate, prolongation of this uh, uh, working group. It's called the Collaborative Research Center by the DFG. It's kind of the first time in Germany, Origins of Life was seriously funded in this collaboration. And we are defending this in January, keep fingers crossed and I'm um, part of the science collaboration of Origins of Life, which unfortunately will also end in 23. So we'll all have to look out for more funding. We got the ERC advance grant and other uh, nice funding opportunities. And I wanna thank all the hardworking students in the lab. Thanks very much and happy to take questions. I might actually, I don't know. Thank you very much. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, there's a lot of questions in chat. Yeah, I just have chat? to open. I just have to open it. Yes. Oh, if you okay. could read a question before answering it, that Absolutely. would be great for people Absolutely. that will watch the recording. I'll just. Uh, is there any way to template the polymerization instead of random monomer assembly? Use a template to do sequence specific uh, assembly. I mean that you know the polymers which we are creating. That's just random. In the dry state, you know, there's no way we can make that better. But the idea is that we make that, you know, shorter strands, like we have all combinations, and then that gets to the uh, wet state, and then it does this templated ligation, which should be actually quite sequence specific. And by that, we would run, you know, you know what's called a, 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 a ligation chain reaction. Uh, you know, exponential growth. And we showed that for, for, uh, for the very harsh uh, chemistry of EDC. But the problem is that that chemistry is chewing up its own molecules as it goes along. But, you know, in principle, I think in the two, three prime, we should be able to do that. So the question by Chris Vanet is uh, amazing. Could you run polymerization experiments like that with liposomes? That's an interesting question, and we collaborate here with James Sins from Dresden. 
but we are just starting to to figure out you know he figured out that you know quadruplex structures of g like lipids and that could be interesting anchors and you know let's have a look whether lipids would help you know we should also screen uh, in a similar way the um amino acid role of amino acids and and other things but but you know at this point we are a bit happy that you know it just needs g for polymerization nothing else and a little bit phosphorylation from phosphate uh, i tend to try to push that because it's possible for origin of life more simple but you know all these are all good points you know the um, i think the interesting point is that you know we see some activity along that logical line from which we can amplify and 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 that's always interesting if there's some base uh, uh mechanism already there you know then evolution can jump on it and you know does the magic and trying to, to optimize could the thermal cycling system be used to facilitate previous chemistry of monomer synthesis to um, make nucleotides? Uh, yes, we have a project running, and um, we hope that the wet dry cycling and, and that is helping. You know, it could also be that we can get pH gradients in these systems, which, you know, for some of these settings, we might to go for other pHs. That could be something where this can help. Um, but of course, you know, that's. I didn't talk much about chirality. There's also an idea that this poly G dominance of the polymerization could, you know, decide chirality in that polymerization step. And then it would be actually good if you have in the same chamber also the synthesis. But, you know, there's this uh, ongoing argument and John Sutherland, I think, has a very good point why he's pushing the, the synthesis the way uh, he sees that with high uh, yields and, and, you know, very directed steps that rather than thinking about you know sugars which would be tons of conformations and trying to have that low low yield reaction to add the base and hopefully make your way but but who knows i mean there might be feedback loops from that polymerization back on such a project uh, on on such a process uh, we'll just need to figure out uh, we we just you know we tried john sutherland chemistry to introduce in here but that's a little bit uh, not yet working as much as we'd like to do. Uh, so we are a bit uh, on the search there. Uh, Self-free system would uh, survive the temperature gradient. It is, this, this is very, um, very valuable data. Do you think it would be possible to use it for more practical applications like astropharmacy or point of care manufacturing? You know, if you have it, if you're not diluting it, right? Uh, um, you don't need us. Uh, you know, we are more interested in, in principle that, that we can rescue by the dilution, but also to, to show that you potentially can feed it for longer times. So, so if, if that feeding turns out, uh, we'll have to see that's, you know, the post step after the paper we're just trying to prepare, you know, if that feeding could be run reliably, then we could start talking, you know, then it, at best, you know, you bring in ATP, you get away those pyrophosphates, or you, you know, you can link the system such that it replenishes, you know, food in, rubbish out, you know, that would be the perfect uh, dream. Uh, but there's a, a lot of things to, to look into that and figure. Why the self-free expression system based on E. coli, I said, did not work in your setup. Any explanation? Um, we don't know, honestly, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Noel worked his, uh, you know, really worked hard and we, we saw strange things and was sometimes there and then not, and we couldn't reproduce nice enough. You know, the one day we switched because we had the money for the pure system, you know, basically everything worked. So I will never look back, uh, but uh, some, you know, perhaps once we really now know the business, we can go back and have a look, but otherwise I'm just uh, at this point a bit, uh, yeah. That two years of frustration of, of a hard work in postdoc, we don't want to look back into, to be honest. Um, could you concentrate other enzyme pathways, for example, metabolic engineering pathways? Uh, very good question. Um, you know, once we, we can feed these systems for a longer, longer time, I think a lot of interesting things can come up. You know, there are other ways to feed cell-free systems, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, of course, our is more simple in terms of prebiotic uh, settings. Uh, it's not yet clear whether we have also the advantage when it comes to 
to others. I, I, I hope so, because we have a lot of, you know, geometry things by which we can really fine tune the system. We have the system, the computer, we can, you know, fine tune for whatever you'd like to have inflow, outflow, and, and hopefully we can really engineer this. So I, I think many things are possible if we really look into it. Could the gradient be created by lower temperatures, for example, minus 10 to minus minus 10 to 10 in some eutectic solution you know that's a free parameter you can you know can push things for lower temperature you actually um in these microfluidics at minus 10 degrees it's not yet freezing because you you you're lacking the the condensation point uh, at some point so um and and you know with phil holliger we always think and discuss you know could you you know couple that to phil holliger eutectic uh, story we have, you know, really discussed it at length, have not yet really figured out something where we'd love to get things together because those ice surfaces seems to be important. The accumulation which you get by the freezing into your tech solution is interesting. Um, but if you couple that, you know, you tactic solvent with water, right, the holes, you know, it will dilute again, and you would need to make that in a trap where on top you are refeeding that system. That you so you would need to have a system which you know on top might have whatever uh, you know 40 20 and then it cools down as it goes at the bottom and then you have the eutectic ice at this point it's not impossible to do we are pushing our system with the sapphires that is rather stable on the right and left hand side uh, but uh, you know we can have the heaters only on top and coolers at the bottom we can do that you know that would be a setting which i think goes in what what you're thinking um and would it be possible to induce some kind of artificial cell cycle uh it's amazing probability possibility way to induce circadian like or other cycling um you know we think that these systems are driven by volcanic sources so they should be rather stable in terms of day night cycles but they might run in day night cycles so you have a difference you know like in the cell free 2640 it might be you know 20 uh, 30 45 and then go to 20 30 in reality uh, on early earth or, uh, but um, um you know by that you could uh, play these games i'm not an expert on circadian cycles how much they actually depend on temperature and not on other factors but that shouldn't be a too difficult thing to do honestly yes Okay, I can uh, oh. stop sharing the screen. That might help a bit the discussion. And those are the um, questions I got from the chat. Sorry. Yeah, hopefully it was informative. Have... Please follow up if, if I didn't answer good enough. Uh, I have a question that I didn't put in chat. I want to be brave enough and ask by mouth. Um, have you tried crowding reagents in the cell free experiments? So for the cell free, there are a uh, peg inside and, and that might okay. be that might be part of the trouble because um, peg and thermophoresis might be a bit a special case. Uh, you know, uh, people studied uh, the influence of peg and thermophoresis and it actually um, inverts then the accumulation of the other material. So it first peg gets away from warm to cold and then actually the dna which wanted to go from warm to cold actually then goes from cold to warm because of that crowding and it could actually be that that's part of the problem when we went into those systems and we should actually look into that without peg but i'm not sure if, if interesting Noel, if yeah, noel is around it was really... he can he can uh, say something about it yeah. noel <laughs> you want to comment Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. No, actually, so in part, uh, one of the problems relies in the fact that in our drug chambers, the only oxygen available is the one dissolving water in the water uh, solution. So this means that they cannot reliably quantify uh, the fluorescence of the protein produced there. So what that was one of the problems. Another problem uh, would have potentially but, been- But Noel, we had the same problem with the cell free. So I'm not sure whether that's really at the- no, no, but oxygen. the cell extract is much more complex, right? So it might be yes. that also it consumes the oxygen uh, presence in the solution. Yes. Yes. 
but also what they wanted to say is that by the time uh, I was not treating the surface as our chamber. So the interaction also with the sapphire which is the material that is directly in contact or that was directly in contact with uh, the E. coli lysate might have also uh, impaired the efficiency of, yeah. the, of the, and as you said, I mean, the polyethylene glycol as well might have also been part of the problem. So I, I guess at some point it's worthwhile going back and have a look, yeah, but sure. Sure. one after the other. Yeah. <laughs> oh Noel, do you want to go cell free with E. coli? Yes. <laughs> Actually, I mean, <laughs> that was the original plan, right? But uh, yes. as you said, it was two years, almost two years and a half of yeah. pain. <laughs> yeah. Well, congrats on getting it to work in the end. Hopefully, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, if there are no more questions, I want to say thank you so much again and thank you for thanks answering for all me. the it was questions. A Come on, folks. And you don't thanks. want to have more discussion on anyway. I'm, I'm that's okay. It's one hour, <laughs> you know, it's it's long enough. Yes. No one is brave enough to unmute and ask questions. Yeah. You know, right. the, the right design so might come to him. <laughs> yes. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks very much. And I'll hang great... around. I'll hang yes. around if you want to have a, you know, follow up questions. Uh, if okay. Kate wants to open the channel open. It can stay open. I will stop recording.